All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Artificial Disc Replacement Support Group on Facebook. I have the wonderful Dr. Rosuli with me this evening. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I think this is gonna go tremendously well. We all have been really excited about this, as I mentioned. Um, you know, Dan Clark has kind of really kind of brought you into the group quickly with a, with a lot of good expertise. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, Dr. Rosuli, what made you get into spine surgery and, and then what made your practice kind of turn into more of the artificial disc or total disc replacement? So spine surgery, I'll, I'll take that question first. Um, uh, when you're in medicine, you're kind of stuck in medicine. It's a super specialized field and you spend all these years trying to master the skills of being a good doctor. Um, I've always been drawn to spine because I want to do the hardest discipline in, in medicine and uh, that's spine. I think the um, in terms of the attention to detail and the level of skill that you have to have to be good at spine surgery is probably harder than any other field in medicine. And so I was drawn to that. That's why I went into the spine and it's been really rewarding. Um, you can really help people's lives, young, old, um, uh, sort of active, sedentary, it doesn't matter. But if you, if you do it well and you take care of patients well, they do well. And so uh, that was my draw to spine surgery. Disc replacements um, came about five years after I had really sort of established myself in LA. And the reason I, I started to entertain disc replacements was because of the results we were getting with fusion. No matter how good you are as a surgeon, fusions end up um, altering people's lives because they alter biomechanics a lot. And um, you never just do a fusion and never see the patient again. They always come back with the other level having a problem or the fusion doesn't take. Whatever the case is, I started to think, would I want this done on my back or my neck when, when my time comes? And the answer was no. So I couldn't in good faith recommend fusion as the preferred surgery um, for my patients. And so if they met the indications for disc replacement, and those indications have become broader and broader, indications meaning the people in whom we can do the disc replacements and safely and effectively. Um, as they became broader, um, I started to recommend it more. And uh, because we've done so many, we became good at it. And uh, now fusion is, is the sort of the minority procedure we do. And disc replacement is the majority procedure. I'd say probably 85% of my surgeries would be disc replacement. Fantastic. And then let's step back a little bit. Tell me a little bit about, you know, going from high school to college to medical school. You know, tell me that route and why you kind of did what you did and, and maybe just why you were always, you knew as a kid, you always wanted to be a doctor or, or how was it? So in high school, I was good at science um, and I was good at the humanities. And um, there are lots of fields you can go into uh, with, if you're good at you know, different stuff. But the one field for me that combined the two uh, was medicine. So I was drawn to medicine because I got to use uh, communication skills as well as sort of the uh, science skills. So that was a natural draw for me. Um, and it's, I mean, medicine is not a perfect field. It has its challenges, but the, the interaction you get to have with people um, and at the same time, the, the, uh, the critical thinking skills you have to use um, are, I don't, I don't think they're found in many other professions. So that was the, the draw for me. College was just merely a uh, confirmation of that. Um, and so, you know, you go through your requirements, the coursework you have to do to, to sit for the uh, medical um, admissions test. College is basically a rite of passage for us. And then by the time you get into medicine, uh, you're given all this stuff to master. Uh, and, and at the same time, you're thrown in front of patients and you have to be a good doctor. And uh, being a good doctor, I think first and foremost means you, you listen and you take good care of patients by listening and tending to their needs. But you also have to know what you're doing. And so uh, therein is, is the challenge of being a good doctor, I think. Great. And then as today, you can take this as a, as a guesstimate, I guess. 
how many artificial disc replacements have you done? To, you know, how many to per disc for cervical and for lumbar? Would you? So uh, each one, cervical and lumbar, uh, at or uh, over a thousand. Okay, and then uh, multi level. Now I know you've done, uh, you know, a few of our patients in our group multi level, and then maybe you can, t you know, a lot of a lot of our folks go to doctors here in the states, and they said, listen, one level, and that's it. How are you able to get around those barriers with insurance here in the United States? So uh, I'm in a market where uh, the demographics are such that some people can afford to come out of insurance and um, you know pay out of pocket for multi levels. We still are able to get two level disc replacements on rare occasions in the lumbar spine approved by insurance or workers comp. Um, uh, some are uh, personal injury cases, and so um, uh, you know there isn't. Uh, the, the, the limitations and the number of levels don't really apply in those cases. Um, but by and large, uh, the pathology is either one or two levels uh, in the lumbar spine. And um, for the two levels, unfortunately, insurance is lagging behind. So those are the options that, that, that I mentioned that we have. For cervical, the, the environment's a little bit different and more favorable. So cervical, two level uh, cervical artificial disc replacements are FDA approved. And so most insurers will cover two level. The real challenge is patients already had a fusion and then needs the level above the fusion done. Well, our inclination is to do disc replacements at those levels, the so-called hybrid construct. So a disc replacement next to a fusion. And those are still very challenging to get approved. Hmm. But you, you will do a hybrid as well. Say if someone comes in with three levels, you know, the bottom three levels, will you if you use L5, S1 and, and two levels above that if, if affordability is there? Oftentimes. Okay. Oftentimes. Um, what, uh, let's start with lumbar. What lumbar disc have you used and what do you favor now? So I used uh, Charité when the disc replacement technology initially came out and then uh, ProDisc L. Um, my experience with ProDiscL is extensive, and because it works so well in my hands, it's sort of the thing that I use. Um, and uh, with uh, cervical disc replacements, um, ProDisc C was what I initially used, and it's a very good system. Um, but the FDA approval of Prestige LP and the Moby C, which are the other systems that I've used, kind of forced our hand into using those systems. Uh, Prestige LP has worked extraordinarily well in our hands and, and has them uh, as well as the Moby C has. Um, the the ProDisc uh, C is now beginning uh, trials for multi-level, like two level and possibly three levels. Uh, they're all good systems. Uh, they all have their limitations and their pluses and minuses, but by and large, the cervical systems all work pretty well. Um, and those are the three that I've used that have worked well for me in the cervical. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any allergy situations with the uh, prestige with metal on metal, you know, where they're? Uh, zero. Zero? Yeah, we've seen zero. Okay. All right, good. Um, moving on. Um, when your patient comes in, what do you usually like for them to have? And, and this makes your job easier. Obviously, MRI, x-ray. Do you like a DEXA scan as well? Um, you know, obviously for the older patients, that may have a great looking spine, but you know, you're worried about their bone quality. Yeah, so in terms of imaging studies that we would like patients to, to have, ideally come in with, but to have ultimately, uh, X-ray, MRI, the X-ray assesses stability. So uh, the X-ray is obtained with what we call flexion extension. So you can see the, the spine move and you can determine whether the spine is stable enough for a disc replacement. So we want X-rays. MRI goes without saying, it shows you the bones, it shows you the discs, and it shows you the nerves in, in relation to those two. What many practitioners don't get, and you really should have, is a CT scan. And a CT scan uh, really reveals a lot of things that the MRI may miss, particularly calcified discs, uh, joints, facet joints that are uh, degenerated beyond what would uh, be sort of acceptable for disc replacements because you're trying to restore motion, uh, but if you're restoring motion against a really disfigured facet joint, the patient's not gonna benefit from that. 
extra scans, uh, which is the bone density scan. It tells you how robust your bone is going to be in supporting the disc replacement. I get for anyone over 50 years of age. I don't get them indiscriminately. Uh, but those are kind of the four studies that we would love for patients to have. The other thing we're really, really looking for is a trial of non-operative treatment. So physical therapy, maybe the cortisone injections, the epidurals and the facet injections, uh, basically uh, building the sort of the case against the insurance companies that this patient's tried everything they can and surgery is really the, the last resort, which it should be. Surgery should be the, the last resort. And in the few patients that we do end up operating on, uh, those who have gone through the conservative management uh, and have ended up resolving for themselves that surgery is the only option, they do the best. Uh, and, and I could completely agree. I mean, with our group, that's the way we preach to our members as well. And, yeah. and that way, it makes things much easier, like it says, for you to get that patient to where they need to be. Or are they too, here too soon, too early, and it's just, you know, it's just a conversation piece at this point. Right. So we really definitely try to, you know, say, listen, conventional, do some injections. We, we're, some of us are big believers in PRP, the MAC. Some aren't. You know, it's, it's still kind of out there, but, you know, it works for some people and it doesn't. I mean, that's definitely the conclusion that we've come, come from from our group. Um, do you use a, a vascular surgeon? So I do. Uh, in my lumbar uh, disc replacements, I use a vascular surgeon. Uh, he does the approach for me. Um, and uh, given the, the volume of cases that we've done together, I consider him one of the best, if not the best in the world. And he's the reason ah. we're able to do these surgeries outpatient. And I mean, literally outpatient disc replacement. So you come in, you get your surgery and you leave that day. Uh, that's not possible without a vascular surgeon who, do, can, who can do the exposure efficiently. Usually most of the time under five minutes. That's fast. Yeah. Fast. Let's, let's talk about uh, your vascular surgeon a little bit more because we always have patients who come in it says, you know, I've, I have had a hernia, I've had ba multiple babies, I've had multiple C-sections, and we get these questions a lot, and we know how to answer these questions, but obviously coming from us, coming from someone like yourself, it's going to dig, it's going to go much deeper. So what are your uh, qualifications on what would make somebody not be able to get uh, artificial disc replacement surgery if they had something going on uh, surgery-wise in their stomach? Uh, nowadays, very few things stop us from, uh, from doing surgeries through the anterior approach. Um, uh, so revision, uh, usually it would be previous spine surgery, previous anterior spine surgery would be uh, our main reason not to attempt. Uh, but nowadays, even our ability to do even revision anterior spine surgeries has, has improved significantly. Um, so there isn't much that would stop us anymore. Okay. Great answer. Great answer. Um, Doing revision surgery, I, I know the group is very interested in care. Once, if some people do go to Europe because of the cost, you know, we do know that sometimes the cost can be uh, a little bit better there. Will you take care of a patient if uh, if they run into problems, or would you be their, you know, doctor to follow up with? We're here to take care of patients. So if if they've had problems and they need it taken care of here, we'd be happy to do it. Okay. We just encourage them to to. Um, maybe exhaust their options here in the States sure. Sure. <laughs> before going to Germany. I think everything they need, uh, they can find here in the States. Fair enough. On your, uh, when you're doing anterior approach, do you do any adhesion barriers? So uh, one of our vascular surgeons does use adhesion barriers and one does not. Um, and I'm not sure in seeing kind of the split 50-50 uh, between them, whether it uh, matters or not. Um, we call it the patch. Um, and in the revision surgeries that I've seen, it, I think it does help significantly in elevating some of the structures that would be scarred down, but it's really surgeon preference. Uh, the vascular surgeon that doesn't use a barrier is perfectly comfortable doing the dissection through scar tissue. Fair enough. Do you, uh, do you remove osteophytes in the lumbar or in the cervical area when you're doing uh, replacement? So my motto is attention to detail. And so, yes, I do, uh, because those osteophytes can, can be uh, the difference between a surgery that looks good and a surgery <laughs> that is excellent. So uh, we, we kind of restore what we feel is the anatomy, and then we go from there. 
Do you use uh, bone wax? I use bone wax primarily to stanch the bleeding after surgery because um, blood loss and uh, what we call ectopic or adventitious bone, that's when bone grows around a disc replacement. Uh, you don't want that happening, by the way, because that's like having a fusion. Uh, blood loss and that sort of extra bone growth go hand in hand. So we like to minimize the blood loss by using uh, bone wax sparingly, but we use it. Okay. Um, what is your post-op pain control as far as, uh, you, you know, one thing you mentioned outpatient surgery. So obviously you, you don't want these patients in a large amount of pain when they get home and yep. nobody to take care of them. So what is your post-op pain control? So our innovation in that department borrows from uh, some of our brilliant anesthetists at the surgery center, and uh, they borrowed from the plastic surgeons and how, how they were able to do abdominal reconstructions and in their offices, basically. So our anesthesiologists use what are called tap blocks, which are a regional form of uh, anesthetic administered either before or right after the surgery into the abdominal region that essentially deadens the pain for two to three days. Um, and uh, so the patient is able to do the surgery outpatient without requiring all the narcotics uh, that would for otherwise force them to do the surgery in the hospital. Right, rebivacaine, I think is what it is, with, which is the long lasting. Long lasting uh, regional. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic stuff when you see people getting total knee replacement and they're moving their knee six, you know, six, six hours later, it's, it's yeah. pretty phenomenal. And, and, you know, I'm so glad it got approved here in the States, I think, what, two years ago. Yes. It, um, so say if someone has issues, you know, six months in, and, I, you know, I know the pro disc really doesn't move, uh, but say there's a situation that happens, is there, is there any kind of revision insurance covered, or would that be just billed through insurance? Just one of these questions that a lot of patients tend to ask. If yeah. They're, well, naturally, they want to know <laughs> who's going to pay for things when they go wrong. Sure. Uh, in the few cases where you know things have so so ProDisc does really well, it's very stable. But in the few other systems that we've seen move or migrate, um, uh, its insurances are pretty understanding in those cases. Uh, they usually foot the bill, uh, but uh, sometimes it comes down to the surgeon saying this is a this is a complication that we're going to just have to absorb. Um, but usually, it's insurance that steps in for us. Okay. So patient comes in and um, just patient presents, right? And patient presents L5, S1, bone on bone, L, and the L4, L5 has a little disc left. Are they, a, are they a patient that's eligible for total disc replacement? Saying that their facets are, are decent shape. Uh, the answer is yes. You'd be surprised at uh, how much height restoration or anatomic restoration we can get at L5. 5S1, even when it's bone on bone, as long as the facet joints are preserved. Um, L5S1's candidacy for a disc replacement is not in, in necessarily in um, terms of the amount of collapse at the disc. It's in the shape of the sacral slope. So right. if you have a really steep sacrum or sacral slope, you probably don't want to use a disc. You can, but it probably won't move very much. Um, if it's a little flatter, the slope, uh, you'd use a disc replacement. Otherwise, you do a fusion at L5-S1 and a uh, disc replacement at L4-L5. I have to tell you, the amount of hybrids I've done, in other words, a fusion at one level, disc replacement at the other, as the number has been going down and the number of dual level disc replacements has been going up. And that's just uh, from my experience and seeing that really the L5-S1 disc replacements do do well, contrary to what we thought at first, where uh, L5-S1 disc replacements did not do well. Um, uh, our results indicate that they do just fine. One of the one of the big issues that members have after disc replacement, whether it be you know the two scenarios you talked about, either a hybrid or approach or, or double disc replacement, is SI joint problems. Um, and, and I think a lot of a lot of surgeons miss that it's typically an SI joint problem prior to, to being a disc replacement issue, but. You know, that's a whole different scenario. We can talk about that road. But say someone does get replacements and now they have this, this pestering feeling that their SI joints are, are lax. Um, what do you do in that case? So uh, about 20% of our patients have postoperative SI joint irritation. And that's because we are, we're altering the relationship between the sacral spine and the, and the pelvic bones. Um, uh, most of those... Uh, resolve within about a year and a half. 
uh, with the help of injections in the SI joint and sometimes ablations. But it's in almost all cases a temporary issue. Gotcha. Um, speaking about the L5S1, we didn't talk about this. The Activel, you know, they have a disc for that uh, for that area, which is more of a scalp design, more natural looking. Have you have you tr tried the Activel at all? I haven't. I haven't tried the Activel. Um, I've had good enough experience with what we use, the Pro Disc, um, that we haven't explored it. It's something that we'd be happy to explore, but it just hasn't been necessary in our repertoire so far. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so a lot of patients complain about distraction. You know, they're the ones that are bone on bone or have very little disc left. You go in, you distract it, place your disc in, and now they have all this extra nerve pain going down their legs that they never had before. It seems like some patients last weeks, some patients last months, and we've had patients last, you know, year and beyond. Um, we've got some solutions that we kind of think that, you know, can help rather than always being an extension of work and inflection and stretching those muscles out. I don't know what your protocol is, maybe post pre-op and post-op, but preventing those and preventing those distraction pains. And do you have anything that works well? So um, we don't see very much distraction related uh, nerve issues after these surgeries. Uh, the actives during the, the surgery itself, uh, I make sure I do a really good posterior lateral release and I decompress the foramen. So I give the nerves a lot of room. And by the time we, we do distract or we, we restore the intervertebral height, I think the nerves are free uh, and not tethered. So we don't really see too much of um, the post-distraction nerve radiculitis. Um, what are your contraindications for uh, total disc replacement? My number one contraindication is bad bone. Okay. So osteoporotic or even osteopenic bone, uh, that kind of takes you out of the game. Uh, however, we, we're having a lot of luck with these uh, bone augmentation medicine, the parathyroid on analogs like Forteo in, in uh, people who really want the disc replacement and are willing to take this bone sort of building medication every day for six months, we've had tremendous results in terms of reversing their osteoporosis or osteopenia, and then they suddenly they become candidates. That's, uh, that's fantastic. That's something that we talk about, but a surgeon's never really, really brought up. And, and I agree. I think we've even had quite a number of patients, female patients, get on that, and six months later, their they're yeah. score scores have gone up dramatically. Is there anything else that, that you recommend to get their scores up besides those drugs that, you know, off, off the top of your mind? Uh, nothing really as potently as those drugs and as uh, quickly as those drugs really work very well. So most, uh, most things out there, most remedies out there prevent further bone loss, but only those medications really reverse the bone loss. Okay. Um, what about, uh, some of the drugs for nerve pain, like gabapentin and things like that. A patient comes in and they're on you know, multiple gabapentin and Lyrica. Are you, how soon do you try to get them to taper off of that? Um, no sooner than six weeks if they're on it, but usually at, at three months. Because um, I really think those medications help with uh, um, the recovery process and pain control after surgery. And what do you do to prevent uh, heterotropic ossification? Yes, so that extra bone growing when you don't want it to grow, heterotropic ossification. Uh, minimize blood loss during surgery, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, uh, begin early motion during the surgery, uh, after the surgery. And then number three is anti-inflammatories. So you don't give anti-inflammatories in fusion patients, you do give them in disc replacement patients. What about that person who gets the hybrid? What do you, what do you give them? Uh, Anti-inflammatories. Even with the fusion? Yes, so I'm not too worried about uh, the fusion taking because I use bone morphogenetic protein. So I'm not worried about <laughs> the fusion happening. Why don't you, uh, we, we don't talk about bone, BMA. Why, can you tell us a little bit of science about that? Yeah, BMP is bone morphogenetic protein. It's this magical substance that was invented at UCLA that takes advantage of um, basically overriding the way that cells behave and divide in an area where fusion is to take place. And it coaxes your body cells to become bone cells. 
and it does it very well and very efficiently, sometimes too efficiently. So if you use too much, you get complications of extra bone growth and fluid accumulation and all that. But if you use it sparingly, it, it leads to very quick and efficient fusions. Do you use it with anything else in your fusion? I mean, do you place the, uh, do you, um, no like demineralized bone or bone from? Sometimes we may use some some bone filler like uh, demineralized bone from cadavers and things like that. Okay, just just you know, I, I've been in the business, so I'm always curious about what right. you guys, what, you know, what uses. Um, have you, as far as going forward, what what do you think the changes will be in in, in total disc replacement? I mean, as far as I mean, we know the pro disc is great, but you know, there's going to be probably something coming out that's better. Um, where do you, I mean, people are ever talking to you about, hey, we want you to, you know, maybe come up with something. I mean, obviously you're on the forefront in the United States, so it's pretty deep in your, your, your brain on what would work better. Yes. So there are two innovations that have to take place with disc replacements. Uh, number one, they have to be more customizable to the patient. So right now you have, a, no matter what disc replacement you, you get, you have an axis of rotation or hopefully multiple axes of rotation um, that are pre-configured and pre-configured for the average human being. Well, uh, people aren't average, everybody's unique. And so customizable disc replacements um, uh, would be the, the uh, technical innovation, okay? Number two, uh, the whole socioeconomics of disc replacement, the payers, the insurance companies have to become more accepting of the technology. Uh, right now they, they uh, approve fusions at a drop of a hat but why would you approve something that leads to so many complications afterwards over uh, a technology that really is proven to make people's lives better, faster? So those two things, one social, one technical. What, um, and, and then the MX, M6C has been uh, approved by the FDA. Have you started to use that in your practice? Or you, we have you, not. We have not yet. Uh, it, the The other things we've we are using work so well for us that we've had little motivation to. But we're always looking to explore the new technologies, and we will start using that soon. Um, and then finally, the, the the evolution from fusion to artificial disc replacement. Can you go into detail in, in the past, like five to ten years, on how you think it's evolved in your practice? One from going from an outpatient, from an inpatient to an outpatient procedure, but also how it's evolved on the recovery with the patient. You know, where, 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 where they can lead to an amount of time compared to from a fusion to, to a disc replacement. Yes. So uh, at the outset, a fusion surgery usually requires um, a lot more um, healing capacity on the part of the patient. And I, I mean that from the get-go. So there are longer surgeries, there's more, there's more blood loss, there's more pain, uh, and there's a, there's a longer recovery period. All of that makes the fusion surgery more conducive to being done in the inpatient setting where the patient spends a couple nights. Um, although I, I still do patient, uh, fusions in the outpatient setting in the few cases that I do fusions. Disc replacement surgery necessarily means, if you're going to be good at doing it, necessarily means you're efficient and you don't take forever to do the surgery. And second, you don't lose blood. You know, we, we lose maybe at most two or three cc's of blood, which is a minimal amount. That's all conducive to doing the surgeries in the surgery center and letting the patient go home the same day. And it's also conducive to super fast recovery. Rapid recovery is what I call it, uh, which were a maximum of two weeks. And most patients are, are back to driving in a, in a couple days rather than a few months, which is what we had with fusion. Finally, you restrain a fusion patient. You have to put them in a brace. They can't do much. They're limited. Not so with the disc replacement. You want those people to move. What about uh, the patients that come in with a BMI, say, at 29 to, say, 35? Will you take those patients? We, sh we sure do. You'll, you'll do that. Your uh, access surgeon, no issues. Huh? He's that good. Yeah. He gets all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we, we might have to interview him next. <laughs> yeah, I think we might have to. Yeah. <laughs> that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Um, you know, that's, that's all. I, let me ask you, I do have one more. Your patient comes in. What are your follow-up timetables? You know, so, so I, I come in, you put three level, 
you do a hybrid on me, two levels, we got one approved by insurance. Where do you want to see me, you know, from then on? So uh, we do the surgery, we get approval, we do the procedure. Um, uh, hardware failure, meaning when things go wrong, when hardware fails, or uh, which we haven't seen, but theoretically, if it's to happen, it'll happen within usually within the first two or three weeks. So I want to see the patient two or three weeks after the surgery for x-rays. After that, I want to see the patient back in about three months for another set of x-rays, just to make sure everything is where it should be. And then I do a final follow-up between uh, six months to a year based on their schedule and their demands. And that's the other thing versus fusion. With this replacement, you don't need to follow up that much. Yeah, just a, just a phone call or email. So say uh, there's somebody from New York, there's somebody from Canada. We know our kid friends in Canada have things even worse up there. Yeah. Uh, do you take, do you do too many international patients? I guess that's the first question. We do. A lot, a lot of out of town and a lot of international. Yeah. A lot of Can Canadians. We have a lot of Canadians in our group. I, I was going to say uh, I'm not sure about Canadians in particular, although we'd be, we'd be happy to help them. Um, and then what, what, what is your process? So I'm, I'm in New York, but you're in California. What, what, what are the steps I need to do to, to work my way in? Obviously, we talked about conservative treatment, getting the injections, doing everything, sending all those documentations that we look for. And then are you gonna, you're able to see that person and examine them and then possibly do surgery that week? Or would you need them to go back and forth? You know, just trying to be efficient because you use the word efficient a lot, right? And how can that how can that patient be efficient? They've gone through every protocol possible with their local neurosurgeon or orthopedic. That 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 surgeon saying fuse, fuse, fuse. I saw this video with Dr. Rasuli. He sounds fantastic. I'm, I want to go to Los Angeles. How can we do that? So I'd love to take credit for it but because I have an awesome office support staff and they, they basically take care of everything. And usually with our out of town patients, it's, it's, it comes down to, uh, they're sending some imaging studies that I can review. Uh, we talk to them over the phone. Uh, and if we, we feel that they're a candidate for surgery, they, they come into town, I examine them and they have surgery the next day or that week. Okay, fantastic. Do you use a hospital or a surgery center or both? I use primarily a surgery center uh, and uh, with an excellent support staff and team there. Um, and then in rare occasions, I use the hospital for these cases. If you don't mind, would you mind sharing the names of them? That way people will see this, you know, people want to kind of look, okay, where am I going to be at? Where is this at? Where can I find a hotel to recover at? You know, yeah. before. So, and then that'd be the next question. How soon could they fly home? Sure. So we're smack dab in the middle of Beverly Hills. And so the, the inpatient hospital is called Cedar sinai And the outpatient surgery center is called 90210 Surgery Center, if that's any indication <laughs> of where it is. <laughs> the, um, and so they can fly as soon as 48 hours after the procedure. 48 hours. And then do you give them some uh, medication for they don't clot? Uh, we haven't had to because they're up and about very quickly. There isn't okay. really any period where they're in bed and resting. Um, we haven't had a need to do that. Interestingly, we, haven't, we don't really have a need for aftercare facilities either. Uh, when we started the push for outpatient surgery, we were, uh, we were a little anxious about you know, sending the patients home, so we would send them to these uh, quote-unquote aftercare nursing facilities, not quite in the hospital, but 24-hour uh, nursing in a, in a sort of a facility. And we haven't had to use that for about two or three years. Okay. So I, I've seen this video. I like it. I know where I need to go. I know where you're at. I know where everything is. Where do I send things to? Do you have a, an email? Do we, are we going to send it to Ali, your staff, or is there just a general mailbox? I have an absolutely brilliant administrator named Ali who takes care of everything, and she would be sort of the interface uh, for any patient who wants to be able to, uh, to see what we can help them with. Is so, Ali able to share an email with us today? Yes, I can share that. I can share Ali's email with you. It's aa at rizulispine.com, and that's spelled R A S is in Sam, O U L I S is in Sam, P is in Peter, I and is in Nancy E dot com. And how long does it usually take? Because people are always impatient. We know that they want an answer within 24 hours, and we tell everybody that's that's not normal. How long? How long can they wait? Should they wait in your estimate? Uh, uh, between 24 and 48 hours. That's pretty quick. That's pretty quick. 
Yeah. And, and Allie will give a response, correct? Uh, Allie is amazing, and yes, she will. Okay. That's all I have. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to throw into the group before we, we part ways? No, I'm just real proud of the, the uh, sort of the community you guys have going. I think it's going to make huge inroads, not just now, but uh, years from now, technically and politically. I think it's really important. Well, we think, we think the social, I, I would have never thought this social media would have took off the, the way it has. It's, it's, it's quite astonishing. And, you know, I have, I have doctors and surgeons that join the group and, and they, they're amazed. I mean, I've got a plastic surgeon I'm really good friends with, and he joined the group, and he's he's ready to make some decisions as well, and directions and and whatnot. And and we're trying, like I said, we're trying to keep the best of the best with the group, and and that's why we've been so excited to to interview you. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and Ali getting this all set up. Well, listen, it works both ways. We appreciate it very much. All right, let me stop this recording.